The real threat to markets as U.S. markets continue a record run. Everybody's asking what could derail things. Just in a few hours uh, in, in Davos, I spoke with Blackstone chairman uh, and co-founder Stephen Schwarzman a couple of hours ago. He shared his thoughts on how geopolitical factors will influence markets. The U.S. has announced they don't uh, uh, see the, the possibility of, uh, of having uh, North Korea have a ballistic missile capability that could hit the United States with a functioning uh, nuclear warhead on top of it. I mean, the U.S. has said that numerous times. N no one apparently is listening in the financial markets. If that does happen, uh, you, you would have, uh, I think, financial markets at um, much different levels, and, and that doesn't mean up. Uh, so, so, you know, there's, there's real stuff out there that's... Uh, worthy of concern. Joining me right now is the co-founder of North Island, Glenn Hutchins, and of course, co-founder of Silver Lake Partners. Glenn, it's great to see you. Nice to be here. You know, we, uh, we certainly could use one of those flying cars you were talking about in your earlier segment. <laughs> get, <laughs> You're right. get around this place. It's hard with the snow and all, <laughs> it's right? It's amazing. It's been, I, it's took me a long time just to get here. Uh, new actually. definition for gridlock. Yeah. Let's talk about what you're seeing in terms of markets, Glenn. You just heard what Steve Schwartzman said. How do you see this incredible record run? What are we talking about? 80 new highs in the last year? So, Steve, uh, my former partner, uh, I largely agree with him. Uh, I think the major risks to the markets are probably geopolitical of the type he talked about. And as, as he was referring to, the markets seem to me to be very, very high. You can look across all sorts of measures of um, earnings, uh, PEs, Schiller PEs, size of the markets relative to the GDP, all those things, sorts of things that are all at historic highs right now. Yeah. It's a very um, nervous-making time period. Yeah, a nervous-making time period, but what changes the situation? I mean, earnings have been driving um, valuations, right? And earnings have been largely good. And uh, That's right. And with this tax bill coming in, yeah. uh, where it's adding about 10 percent to projections that are already out there for about 10 percent earnings growth this year, it doesn't look like there's an end in sight right now. Uh, because global growth is synchronized and the economy is good. But we live in this situation that Steve was just highlighting, with which I agree, where the paradox is there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in the world emanating from places like North Korea, the Middle East, uh, and uh, even the United States. Yeah. You know, the, with the government uh, being shut down. Um, it's interesting. You weigh that against uh, the Prime Minister of India coming in, just like the premier of China did last year and taking some responsibility for the world. Yeah. Kind of very interesting way. Did you um, think the prime minister of India, prime minister Modi did well in his opening remarks? This that's morning? my impression. That's my impression. I mean, and, and it's, you know, you're, we're moving into kind of what you could call a post uh, U.S. Britain led world yeah. into a world being led by. And the other interesting news of the morning were the 21 countries that were part of TPP of the United States just agreed to, to adopt the agreement themselves. Yeah, well, what about so that? So with U.S. and Britain sort of withdrawing from world leadership, those countries are stepping into that role. Uh, and it's uh, as an American, it's not necessarily uh, something that gives you a lot of uh, pleasure, but as a sort of looking, if you're thinking about the broader question of markets mm. and uh, ge the geopolitical risk to the very high rate we have in the markets, there are some leaders out there who are offering stability there, in the world as well. There is a new poll of global CEOs out this morning. It shows 57 percent of those expect global growth this year. That sentiment is twice the level of last year. But, you know, we talked before about the market being on, you said it's perhaps a sugar high. Right. And that's different than the, the, the backdrop in terms of economic growth. But, but we no, are talking about 4% growth right but now. But there's another poll out there that shows that 65% of, um, of uh, consumers think the stock prices are going up. Uh, and both the CEO poll and the, con and, the, and the consumer poll are almost certain measures of that the stock market is about to go the other direction, uh, historically. <laughs> God. I mean, one of the things about the, the, the people, there's a lot of talk about the Davos consensus. Uh, one of my ex experiences at Davos, having been here now 18 years, they tell me, um, is that the Davos consensus is almost always wrong. Oh, my God. And okay. almost diametrically well, wrong. Well, that's really important the, for us to know. The most optimistic Davos I ever went to was the one right before the great financial crisis. Wow. Not, uh, not good news. So are you, so are I'm you not expecting saying, that kind of a no, crisis? No, I'm not expecting that kind of a crisis for two reasons. One is that in the short run, we've got this tax bill that's going to add... <laughs> We, you, I've called it a sugar high. Yeah. It's going to add some real sugar to the system. So there's no reason for there to be any uh, blow off uh, right now. 
Uh, and the, this is an equity-induced bubble, not a debt-fed bubble. And the, the equity-induced bubbles you can get through pretty quickly because the correction happens pretty quickly without the long-term overhang of the debt. One of the reasons why we're, it's taken so long to get to this growth and why we finally have globally synchronized growth is we finally worked out all the debt overhang mm -hmm. that we were left with from the great financial crisis, which can take as much as 10 years to get through historically. Yeah, and Maya McGinnis is writing about that today, given the fact that they did a deal in terms of the spending uh, bill, but it only takes you to February 8th, and we're still talking about debt. But, but Glenn, I, I really got to ask you about Bitcoin. You were my guest Again? last week on Wall Street Week. Well, can't we get off this I topic, Maria? I got so much <laughs> feedback about that. And what you said is forget about the price fluctuations where Bitcoin is. You were really focused on the plumbing behind it, the blockchain. Well, that's a blockchain as well, but my point is that um, I'm focused on Bitcoin or really, really digital currencies because Bitcoin could be the wrong digital currency to, to that wins in the end as a means to transfer, not store value. In other words, gold and dollars have two, uh, and currencies have two, two, two uh, functions, the store value and the transfer value. And the transfer of value is what interests me because the Bitcoin technology or the digital currency technology creates the engineering opportunities to really fundamentally change the way we move money around the world. But, you know, and the blockchain is the ledger for that, but the right, Bitcoin the protocol is the technology that enables that to happen. And the blockchain is basically a trust system. I, I, I trust you on the other side of the right. trade. You trust me on the other side of the trade. But I could use dollars for that. I don't need a no, cryptocurrency, well, right? Well, it's actually qu well, quite the opposite, Maria. It's actually we don't have to trust each other because the blockchain creates a mechanism by which there's a permanent record. So you and I can transact without having to trust each other, which means that all the costs of trust that are in the system today, fraud risk, credit risk, settlement risk, custody risk, payment risk, FX exchange risk, translation risk, all that goes away. And so you take costs out of the system, just like with email. And when you, take, when you took a mail and you got rid of the paper and the envelopes and the postman and all the stuff necessary to deliver it, and you just made it digits going around the internet at the speed of light, you took all those costs out. Could I, can I use dollars, though? You can use dollars, but um, according to Ken Rogoff, one of the great economists yeah, of our generation, 90% uh, of U.S. dollar bills are used in, a fraud, uh, in organized crime and tax evasion. Oh, wow. And the okay. reason why is because they're bearer bonds. There's no permanent record. Okay. The blockchain leaves the permanent record. That's why the Bitcoin guys, bad guys get caught, because they leave a permanent trail behind them, and the people who transact in dollars don't. I love this explanation. Glenn, it's really good to see you again. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Glenn Hutchins is the co-founder of North Island.